Blackboard, my copy, my toys ready for me. I miss my school. I love my school. What school is that something new to me? There are animals, plants, and celebrate all festivals. School has paid to improve knowledge, discipline, and personality. My school does the best. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you all here at this time. To uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. So we welcome you all to this power-packed session by the global educators from all over the world on teaching and parenting in COVID era. So, do you ever wonder? about what is the impact of COVID-19 on the role of parents and teachers? How can we ensure children keep learning until preschools and schools reopen? What is the role of technology when online education is the new normal? So today, to enlighten you with exceptional ideas on this, we have with us Dr. Edward and Ms. Kim from Canada. Mr. Cabello from Union of South Africa, Mr. Jacob from Denmark, and from India, we have our own guru of schooling, Mr. Amol Arora, Managing Director of Shemra and Third Group of Schools, who would also be moderating the session. Amol sir heads what must be the world's largest educators owned school brand with more than 650 branches. With more than four lakh alumni, he's opening more than two schools every week. His schools are not only present in almost every state of the country, but also grown across boundaries to Nepal and Bangladesh. 
In 2007, he launched his 10 plus 2 school brand, Shemford, keeping the same philosophy of creating schools where children run to school and walk back home. His senior school venture was an instant success and even got into the Limca Book of Records 2013 for opening maximum schools in the shortest possible time. He has been invited to numerous national and international seminars and conferences. His inspiring story has been featured in various business programs. Over the years he has received numerous awards for his contribution to the education sector. We feel fortunate that Amol sir took this initiative to get global educators on one platform and together they will guide us on how the teaching and parenting is going to change in covid era i would now like to invite the guru of schooling mr amol arora to start the session welcome sir and over to you yes uh, thank you indu ma'am thank you so much um, we're just running a bit late because uh, the zoom and uh, streaming connection was not working so but the team is trying to figure that out but i if i could just request everybody to um everybody else to switch off their cameras and let's get uh, we got a very good interesting panel people with very diverse experience from all over the world today because today's times are have the world has never seen times like this so we all need to learn from each other we all need to pick up good things that are working in different environments different communities and you as parents uh, and teachers uh have so much to learn we all have so much to learn i think the panelists will also uh, pick up uh, quite a few things from each other so um, let me quickly introduce everybody um, uh, dr edward say um, oh, yes that's him yeah he works um, hello he believes that creative learning is a key to resilient education and jobs in a wo world of automation where the if you're not creative you're not going to get a a good career in front of you because the robots are going to win that right so he shares his belief in keynote podcast and panels to make learning fun uh cabello from uh, so welcome dr edward uh cabello um, thank you big welcome to you from from uh from india uh he's a primary school teacher and he's a national spokesperson for the educators union of south africa and chief ambassador for thuma foundation and he's a founder and chairman of the marking app So he's also a wonderful international speaker and has led South African based students uh, fee movements uh, student movements across South Africa so somebody who's very very well respected in Africa uh, we also have uh, Jacob uh, Espen Hansen hey Jacob uh, hey. he's a edtech disruptor so he likes he enjoys this work uh, he works with schools governments edtech companies around the world on online education offline education he's also an apple professional so somebody who understands tech very well so i think it's going to be interesting because suddenly the the limelight has has has, has shifted to uh, ad tech companies and uh, people who are in ad tech and uh, kim meldrum from canada as well uh, a very good morning to you kim uh, uh, she, she's a, she's an she's an educator she's been an educator all her life and she's written a, an amazing book called assessment that matters so teachers and parents that's something that you should definitely consider because and now it with changes times like this where what is assessment and when we are sitting at home kids are at home what is the purpose of assessment and how will assessment change with these times so this is going to be very interesting because kim will bring her own pers perspective to the table so uh, so we got a very good diverse uh, thing and i think straight away i'd like to jump in uh, each one of you uh how what's happening with learning and schooling in your part of the world i think that's the first thing that i'd like to ask and if i can start with uh, uh kim um where are schools how what are children doing at home and if you can and when do we expect schools to reopen and so if you got i'll give it to you kim thank you it's uh, great to be here with everyone it's been a huge change for our schools for our teachers educators and parents as uh, schools closed the middle of march throughout canada and most of schooling has happened through zoom meetings and uh through packages of uh, really 
paper pencil based tasks that have been sent home via internet links to parents to support their students. So it's really been a role change for parents who have had to become teachers. And uh, they're seeing some of the challenges around that. And of course, all the challenges around scheduling, who's using a device, who's running through the room while someone's in a Zoom meeting, all those things that I'm sure we're all dealing with and see funny little examples of in the news. So we're closed now for summer holidays. And the great big challenge over the next couple of months is really what school in the fall will look like. Mm -hmm. And where I'm from, they're talking about high school students going to school two days a week and then working remotely for three days. Um, in the elementary cycle, they started talking about students always being two meters apart, so having small class sizes. Now they're throwing the idea around about mini bubbles. So groups of six children clustered together, which to be honest, I can't quite see how that's going to work. So uh, we'll see what the fall brings. It's a, it's a growth opportunity, I think, for everyone. Okay. So uh, since you are the expert on assessments, what about the final examinations when children were, what happened there? How did the... They didn't have them. It was decided that it really wasn't possible to administer any final exams. So what the schools have been doing, I know my niece is a teacher and she's writing report cards currently, is really looking at what the students had accomplished in the first and second terms and not counting third term. There's been a lot of discussion around what the students were doing in terms of these uh, paper pencil tasks that they had and, and attending Zoom meetings, but you really can't evaluate that because it becomes a massive equity issue. I mean, if you think about the students who don't have access to devices or whose parents are limited because they're working all day in terms of how much support the students have. So sometimes they make a Zoom meeting, sometimes they don't. Uh, so really, it was looking at the work that the students had produced in first and second term. I think that's really was a, a fair approach. So no exams. Woohoo kind of reaction. <laughs> <don't> kids, <right? laughs> uh, okay. Um, and uh, so over to uh, Jacob. I mean, you were just sharing how schools have reopened in Denmark. So what, where are you right now? Yeah, so here in uh, Denmark, we were quite lucky. So schools were only closed for five weeks. Um, in some places, six weeks, but, but so they have been reopened now for, I, I calculated now it's actually seven weeks already that they have reopened. And uh, in the beginning, it was also with uh, a lot of social distance, two meters in between the children. Every class got split into two. Uh, and now, uh, and it was only the younger learners in the beginning, uh, but now it's all learners, uh, only uh, university students are still at home uh, and in remote learning. So now the, it's, it's only one meter uh, in between uh, the kids. Um, and we have had a couple of schools that suddenly saw some uh, cases of COVID-19. And then they have had quite good plans for closing it down and testing and so on. Um, so right now it actually looks quite promising and, and, and the num numbers in Denmark are in general quite low. Okay. Uh, so you said uh, something interesting. You um, mentioned that uh, you started with the younger ones first and the older ones, whereas some we could be confused because right now they're saying, okay, let the older ones come first to school because there's about serious education and younger ones. It's okay. They just need to play and all that. So it's about social skills. So they can wait. So did Denmark consciously choose to bring the younger ones first? What, what was that? Yeah. And I was actually a bit surprised because I was in touch with some uh, people from, from uh, the ministry of education as well in the days up to it. And they had two scenarios, but I think sadly, or, or what, what was, the important criteria turned out to be that parents also needed to go back to work or could work more efficiently at home. So it became school as a, a childcare institution or, or, and not maybe not the, the priority of learning that, that, uh, so that's led to, of, that was the younger uh, More kids. like a daycare, you thought. So this is more of a daycare because... Yeah, they, they prioritized that, that 
parents needed to be able to go back to work or work more efficient from at home uh, for, for financial reasons, maybe. Um, I thought that, uh, yeah. But also they, they knew at that point that they would also go to cancel the exams. So, so. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Edward, um, what about, I mean, you're from Canada as well, but a different part of Canada. So do you see, where do you see it? I mean, you're looking at the sector from an ed tech perspective. Uh, do you believe the younger ones will, will open first or are you expecting a staggered opening in Canada? Well, um, maybe I can speak beyond uh, Canada. I work with, uh, I track a lot of the ministries in different regions uh, across America, uh, in Europe and around the world. It seems that in general, like school closures have affected the vast majority of schools in this time. Um, usually it has been in the form of just straight up, everybody's at home. Um, there have been some where they've still kept things open. Like for example, in the UK, uh, there's been some schools that for special needs students, it was still open. So they, they didn't close officially, but they, they made it so that if people are vulnerable, they still had access to a school, uh, which may be a strategy that others can use as well. But certainly the biggest concern um, because of the ability to do home learning uh, for the older kids seems to be a lot higher than those of younger kids. So certainly the priority has been, mm, what can we do about the younger kids? Because these are the kids that we're gonna have to think about daycare or day homes. Like the, the parents are not gonna be able to work in the event or they'll have to work from home if that's the case. Uh, so that has certainly led to uh, some increased concerns because, I mean, kids are going to be kids. <laughs> they're going to run around. They're going to like, you know, they're not going to really maintain the social distances, the things that we want. And I think really the question is, well, what does that look like? You know, and, and if we need to maintain it, like, can we, like some parents just simply flat out say like, my kids are not going to wear any face masks. And so it's a concern, right? If some of them don't and then some of them do, you're, you're not really going to get much of a benefit uh, from, from the use of those as policy. And so there, there are some real questions about that. So, I mean, right now, everybody's at home. Um, we're thinking about, hmm, what's going to happen in the fall? Like, we've got a little bit of a breather now. The nice thing is the last little while has been pure at home only. Like it's been a straight up closure so that we've been some teachers and educators have a chance to learn about, well, what is just the, 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 the online component about, but the next component, especially in the fall, there seems to be this hybrid, you know, where people are expecting, Hey, as an educator, you got to somehow be both an online teacher and you've got to be like an in-class teacher at the same time. That's where it's going to get very uh, challenging and we're going to have to certainly learn a lot of new things. And I think that, that leads us very well to Cabello, who, who represents the educators now. So how, are, um, I mean, first question is, of course, um, in Africa, how is the uh, closing and reopening happening? And secondly, as Dr. Edward said, uh, are teachers ready for this new role? Just because they were teachers in a school, does that mean they can educate online? So are, are teachers in the developing world ready for this new shift? Um, thank you very much, um, Mo, for the opportunity and greetings to everyone. Um, in Africa, it's quite um, a different and a shocking change that has to happen in education. Because I think, as you would remember, that we are one of the least developed countries, especially in terms of technology. And most of our people still live in remote areas where even access to and basic necessities like electricity is still a huge struggle. So if I just take it to a South African context, we have, I think it's, it's public knowledge that we are one of the most unequal countries in the world where we have those who are rich being very rich and those who are poor being very poor. So this now impacts in our education system because we're using one national education system and for schools that are in the, in, the, in, the, in the cities, it's much less of a stress because uh, we were on, a lock, on lockdown for about two months. The lockdown is still on, but some industries have opened. And because of that, there has been a need for schools to reopen so that parents can be able to go back to work. And 
we have had a lot of challenges because this has happened in our country without a broader consultation of all the stakeholders. And most teachers really feel that we are not ready for this new norm because we have schools that really don't have facilities. We have schools that still don't have running water. Uh, we still have schools that do not have ablution facilities. So there's a huge concern. Teachers do not feel that they have adequate training for them to be able to deal with this new norm. So it's the third or third week now since schools have reopened for only grade 12, which is the final grade in basic education, and we've also reopened for grade sevens. And we are looking at just after a week to welcome more grades into the system. But there's a huge concern in the country as it's happening now. We have had a lot of organizations, my organization as well, trying to stop the reopening of schools so that we can be able to allow the system to be better prepared for how things are going to happen as things go on. But the education minister has been very adamant that they are reopening schools regardless of concerns. And, and that is what is happening right now. But the concern in South Africa is that we have not yet reached our peak of the virus. So we are only about to reach our peak. And actually, we are in the middle of winter right now, where the virus is known to be more powerful. And as we speak, we were, before schools reopened, we were only at about 80 cases of corona, 80,000 cases of coronavirus infections. And now we are at about 110,000 within up two to three weeks of schools reopening. So the spread is really increasing. And it seems like it's only now that people are really panicking. Because I think as we know that we are all still learning about the virus. We don't know a lot about the virus. Our health system is not ready um, for the peak that's going to happen. So we have a lot of concerns in terms of how things are going to move forward. And really people are panicking. The system is not ready itself. We're still trying to get basic services to schools. But at the same time, we need to reopen schools. And teachers, specifically because I represent teachers, feel that they are not ready for what is going to happen. Because most of our teachers do not even have access to adequate health facilities. Our learners do not have access to adequate health facilities. Our schools do not have that. And it's just a panic. So as things are happening right now, as we speak, we have a lot of parents that have decided that they are going to keep their children at home mm. uh, due to concerns about safety. Because most of our parents here, we have households which are headed by people who are really adult. And as you know, that the virus really is not any friendly to adult people who are over the ages of 60, especially. And we've got teachers that have also decided that in protest, they would also be staying at home up until their schools have received adequate resources for them to be able to work with this. You know, we have schools that do not have masks, we do not have hand sanitizers, we do not have water. So it is still an ongoing debate, but on the other hand, schools have reopened and there's a lot of pain. Parents are still not sure whether to send their kids to school or not. And we're expecting more grades, so there's a phased in approach and how learners are going to come in. We started with grade 12 and grade 7. Now more grades are expected to move in uh, as, as, as the weeks come. In August, we're going to have a fully reopened education system. But what is going to happen is that learners are going to be attending in phases, so in groups. So in our education system, on a, on a good public school, a government school, because we've got private schools and government schools, on a good government school, you've got about 40 learners in one classroom. And the, the education minister has advised that we need to have at least 20. So meaning that learners would be coming into school in weeks. Week one, we have the first group of the same class coming in and in another week, they do remote learning. And in week two, the group that is doing remote learning comes to school and they allow the other group to do remote learning. So that is what is happening right now on a general perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, we do face in India also a similar uh, thing. and especially when it comes to technology, we're seeing the same thing where teachers are not prepared. The safety, of course, is, is, is above education. That's the prime concern. So they're not prepared. And what has happened is uh, uh, some states of India, they've actually banned online education because that difference, I don't know, I don't agree with that, but the difference between the haves and the haves not 
is so big that they just said to keep everyone the same level. They just banned online education as such, which is a bit silly in itself. But so right now, because I think everyone's panicking when the governments are panicking and I, because I understand with the governments, they don't have the time to build a mass consensus. It's like data is coming in right there and you have to take a decision. So whom do they listen to? And I think that's interesting. You're saying schools are opening, but teachers are at home and kids are at home. So what are they doing? Just opening the gates and there's nobody there. I wouldn't really call that an opening. Uh, Dr. Edward, you, have, you want to say something? Yeah, Amal, I'm wondering if I can add to that. Um, yeah. I really liked what Cabello said about some of the challenges. Um, I've heard it described by ministries of education. Uh, we used to refer to it as a digital divide, right? So the separation between the, the people who have and have not, especially when it comes to internet. But um, ministers have also started to use different words, uh, in particular, digital segregation. Uh, and that word is very powerful because it has all of the race, all of the gender connotations that go with it. And what you find, especially when it comes to things like internet access, is there's a hierarchy, right? Like if you're a family, typically dad gets the, the internet first, maybe on his phone. Then if they have more money, then maybe mom gets access to it. And then the oldest son, and then maybe the daughter. And a lot of people, like especially when there isn't an, another option, that what we're saying is these individuals just simply don't get an education right now. This is different from school because school, it doesn't matter what your gender or your race is like you still get access to a public education, but that is being denied to a large number of people simply based on things like Internet access. And this is not specific to um, like the very poorest regions of the world, like even in North America, this exact same thing is happening. Uh, and we see a large number of students that are just simply not participating at all in schools. And so there's, there's some real challenges uh, moving forward in terms of how do we make, mm, I, I, like the way I've heard it is uh, education, like we call it like uh, resilient education. So education that it doesn't matter if you're um, at school, you're at home, you can still learn. I know many people are, many countries have already started to use um, I think it's like radio or TV channels. They have like dedicated channels because at least hopefully everybody has access to it. Hmm. But there's a problem. The it's problem like, with those is like that you don't say remember every child, it. That every child has a right to education. So similarly now, if mm -hmm. education is going to be, uh, you know, hybrid as you use the word, it's going to be hybrid. So hybrid means that you need internet uh, connections as well as devices. Then the question comes, who pays for that? And especially... Uh, there's this tussle happening in Delhi where the government asked the private schools to give mobile phones to uh, families. And they said, why do we, why are we supposed to give mobile phones and internet connections to families? They said the government should pay for that. So there's, there's some uh, argument happening there because if the schools move forward with, with, and there'll be a segment of kids who are, who are really parents are motivating them. They're sitting in front of the computers. The children are self-motivated and they're the kids who have no access at all. Now suddenly you have this huge divide within the same classroom. And uh, so it's going to be a big challenge. And Kim, how do you think uh, governments are going to deal with this? Because we, we've talked about staggered openings. Now you have the, you have this segregation of students who are ahead of the curve, who are at, or at least at the same level as the school syllabus was running. And you have kids who've been sitting at home without any access. And now you come with your standardized test and say, okay, let's have our standardized test. We need, we need to know, who gets into which college. So how will, how would this impact? And uh, because parents right now, one of the biggest stresses, especially for the high school kids is that they have the standardized test, which they'll need to give at the end of the year. And uh, it's just become, so to the, yesterday we had a decision by the Indian government that they, they've canceled the, the grade 12 examinations. And they said they can give it later when they have time. I mean, mm -hmm. it'll be done on the basis of internal assessments. So now it's, Assessments as a word is, has been what is traditionally been driving education. It's been the, especially in uh, developing countries, even more so in India and China, where the, we have these shops which open up for how to maximize your grades in your class. So how do you look at assessments now in the hybrid model, Dr. Edwards' hybrid model? How do you think assessments are going to change now? I mean, I think we should unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, please?
Joseph, can you uh, unmute Kim, please? Sometimes the host needs to unmute yeah, them. Yeah, I, I actually um, shifted the host to somebody else so that if there was some problem in the stream. So, uh, Josna, can you do that, please? Uh, let me message her. Josna, are you there? What, um, okay, I think we'll we'll go to Jacob now. So I think Kim will hold your hold your thoughts <laughs> till we get someone to get you out of or out of the locker over there. All right, Jacob. So how, you've been working with the edtech companies, and um, a big concern for parents right now is uh, they kind of understand technology has its role, but it's new for them. And I'm going to ask this from the behalf of parents. I mean, they're, they're thinking of eye strain. They're thinking that. Kids, especially younger children, don't sit in front of the laptop because what schools have done is they've taken uh, the 40 minute classroom and literally translated into the, a full day program on Zoom from morning to afternoon. And clearly that was not the way to go. Where do you, how do you see the role of EdTech in this hybrid model? Where do you see, uh, how should parents decide what they should and should not do? Oh, it's... Um... I think it's a big question and with a lot of, I think it's always important to, to look at the local context as well. But I think for, for many parents, it's so important to remember now that this will be a very special year or, or time, uh, but it's also a lot of, full of lot of opportunities. And, and of course, if your kid has access to a device, uh, the tools you have, have at hand is also always the best tool. So, so try to, to utilize that. But I think also it's actually important to remember that there's a lot of learning in, in play. There's a lot of learning in shared activities. So I think sometimes instead of it's okay as a parent, especially in the beginning to say, okay, now we'll actually take a day off and repair some bikes together and talk about the learning in that building, uh, stronger bonds in the, uh, in the family, um, bake together, maybe uh, try to make uh, two and a half times as much as, as you anticipate and then invite the neighbors. But then there's a little bit of math in it. There's a bit of play in it. Um, building, a, I have built a chicken coop together with my kids and there's been a whole design process in that. And I think there's, it's important to, to also, um, have a lot of time to be a family, uh, rediscovering each other. Uh, so use that as positives. When it comes to technology or the broader picture, I think this is also um, a time where, where countries should reconsider what is important to provide to the citizens or what kind of systems do we want. I think to have this, in many countries we have public transport, we have things that the public do and we have things that private sectors are doing but i think we need to acknowledge that as a country we should maybe reconsider say okay maybe internet access should be something that we ensure that every citizen has maybe we should uh, create better conditions for for public education in general um, and and, and if, when we talk about public education we should think much more deeply about uh, access to devices, access to the internet, uh, so that we aren't that fragile because this will not be the last pandemic or the last situation where we need to go online for a period of time. And I think in general, in the future, there will be a lot of opportunities to make hybrid models where maybe 20% or 25% is online and the rest is in, in, in school. Um, yeah. So you actually, you've scared us more with your comment about this is not the last time, right? So we're going to be, feels like we're in the middle of World War II and run to your bunkers every time. This <laughs> but I think it's important to, to see this as uh, that we need to learn from this situation. Uh, I worked when the, when the pandemic started in, 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 or, or, or started to, to spread in January with schools in Hong Kong. Uh, with three different schools there and, and, and try to create strategies for them uh, or together with them. 
Um, and even that, it was so hard to convince schools in Denmark that they needed to prepare for the scenario. Uh, so I think we could see the spread uh, slowly spreading in the first countries. And it was just so hard to convince schools here in Europe actually to prepare because they it didn't imagine that it would spread that fast. Uh, and I think that shows us that it's very important to be better prepared next time. Because every country say, oh, we had only two days to prepare for online learning, but, but actually we, we had since yet January, if we had used our imagination. Yeah. So I think uh, that was a good point because in March, I think most of the world was still almost living in, we're ignoring it. So it's a small thing. It's going to go away like SARS and H1N1. It's going to be just there for some time. It doesn't concern our part of the world. It's just a few cases. I think then towards the end of March is really when the panic set in and suddenly everything was shut down all of a sudden and we were not prepared. So that's a good point that we need to be better prepared for next time. If uh, it's better, you know, better, you know, prepared, then be sorry. That'll be very foolish of us as human, humans if we're not ready for the, we don't learn and be prepared the next time. And if nothing happens, good for us. But if it does, we should be ready to move back. Um, uh, Kim, have we got you unmuted yet? Jotsna, can you please unmute Kim? Jotsna, uh, let me just, yeah, let me just try. I'll just try. Okay. Uh, so Edward, what, what about you? Uh, what's your take on this? You're muted as well? Jotsna, where are you? I'm here only, tell me so. Jotsna, can you unmute Dr. Ed and Kim and switch okay. on to Bila's camera as well? And switch on uh, Mr. Cabello's camera. Okay, there we go. Uh, okay. Back. Um, thank you. So, so what, what's your take on the, this aspect of, you, because you come from, again, an ed tech perspective. How do mm -hmm. you look at uh, this decision that parents today have in terms of usage of technology? And uh, how should, a, as a parent with schools are closed and technology, I mean, Jacob's given some ideas that learning doesn't have to be just school and tech. There's a... There's a broader world out there where learning can be when you and those skills, those moments of relationship building. So there are opportunities out there. But in terms of technology, what's where do you and you, you've done your research on these subjects, you work with the biggest ed tech companies. How mm -hmm. do you look at the role of tech now and going forward as well? So tech is a very powerful tool that can make it a lot easier in order to scale things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have one device per child. Um, what we found, like if that was the case, for example, then OLPC, um, there's a lot of tools out there, one-to-one -one initiatives would have already changed education. But the reality is like once kids are, <laughs> they have devices, they also have a lot of other distractions too. If they have internet, like there's other things that they can do that are not related to education. And that's one of the reasons why we ha they haven't seen a lot of results uh, from that. But what I've, I've found is that you need to consider both the technology, but you also need to consider the, the pedagogical approach. And one of the approaches that I've really loved is um, Sugata Mitra, actually. He has the kind of learning at the edge of chaos. And what he says is like, no, don't give everybody a computer. Maybe you have like one computer for a cohort. It could be like five, you know, four or five students. But the key here is that you give them hard problems, really hard problems, problems that they won't be able to solve on their own, right? So you give them really good content that they have to answer and they have to work together in order to answer. And then they found in these types of scenarios, I mean, he started with the, the hole in the wall computer and then he moved on to uh, the school in the cloud. The emphasis has always been on you. Once you throw those hard questions, they have to do this line of inquiry. Now, the question is, do I need the teacher there? Do I need them on Zoom all the time? The answer in that case was no. Actually, what they could do in, in the school in the cloud was just they have what they call the granny coach. So the granny coach is just somebody who is there like maybe a grandma um who's a like part of the cohort and they just they have no knowledge no content knowledge 
but they all they do is they try to keep the kids on track. So if they're doing something different, they go, well, no, I don't think you should be doing that. And then they encourage them. Oh, I can't do this. This is too hard. It's like, no, you can do it. And, you know, not answering any questions like, well, what's the answer? I don't know. I Figure it out. And I love that approach because it forces them um, to work together. And it's this philosophy that we as a group are smarter. We are more resilient than we by like the individual than I. And so I like the idea of using technology, but how can technology be a tool to help connect with their interests? Like to me, this is, this is the key in like in school, it's a very controlled environment, like evaluation. It can, is uh, built on this assumption that you can control the environment. Uh, you put everybody into a gymnasium and you don't let them have any phones or any access to the internet, but that's not the case at home. At home, they've, they've got internet, they've got social media, they have lots of distractions like, you know, like maybe video games or toys or, you know, other things that they can play outside. So the question is not, hmm, how do I like just get them to just do the straight curriculum? It's, it's not that. It's about how do I align the curriculum or whatever I need to teach to the students' inherent interests that they have? Because you're not going to be able to fight it. Right. Like the, their, their stuff is always there. It's like their environment is always there. And really the only thing that that student takes with them from the classroom back to home is their own interests, their own motivation, their own self-regulation. So there's got to be a lot more emphasis on student interest in this time, not just, oh, OK, I got to teach the curriculum. No, they got to like rethink this in a, in a very fundamental way. It's one of the reasons why I focus so much on creativity, because I feel creativity is kind of a, it's a reflection of your own, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of like an expression of yourself. So your interests, what you value, the way that you like to represent yourself, that is all represented in your creative examples. That's you. And you're inherently motivated. Um, you're intrinsically motivated to, to work on the things that matter to you because those are your interests. So rather than fight students' Um, natural in, intrinsic interest. No, like my kids, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Like when I started off, um, like uh, learning at home was tough because, you know, they really cared about pirates and they really cared about ninjas and they had like zero interest in the, in the taught curriculum. But once they, um, once they went from, you know what, I'm, did you know that if you go deep in pirates, you know, there's a lot of things you can learn. You can learn about like navigation. You can learn about how resourceful that a pirate needs to be. You can learn about resilience from them. There are many things about history that you can learn. What is the technology that they had to use at the time? Uh, there's so geography, water currents. How did ships uh, move? Precisely. Uh, tra trade. What was trade about? What, why, where Mathematics was is about finding the X. Yeah. Right, like finding the X, the, the X marks the treasure. Well, the treasure in, in this could be algebra. Why is no? gold a treasure? I mean, what, what's, where does gold come from? Why is it so expensive? You can keep building on those things, right? So that's, so Kim, how, how do you, and that, that goes with Jacob's philosophy of, uh, you know, we humans need to really build on our creative uh, parts. If you're gonna beat the machines and not try and, uh, you know, be a machine because that's where the machines are going to win, right? So the human part is, and that's what Edwards also said. So Kim, but again, assessments, how do you assess creativity and how do you, is it important or are assessments going to be important moving forward? I mean, because that's the only way we know, has the teacher delivered? Has the child learned? Uh, which university do you go to? Perhaps for your first few jobs also based on assessments. Now, but we're talking about these skills being more important now. And if, as Jacob said, we need to be prepared for multiple bomb, bombings of viruses happening in the future. We don't know. We've, we've messed up the ecosystem so much. Where, where does a assessment stand in all this? And that's what the parents' biggest worry has always been assessments. And if they say, given a choice between teaching my child creativity and good grades, most parents would choose grades. Yes, and, and I think what everybody has said is really a, a rich pedagogical discussion. And if one thing COVID has done is I think it's brought forward a lot of these questions and a need for us to look at what really is the role of technology. And I, I like that uh, Dr. Ed used the term that it's a tool and that's really what it is. And the value of that tool is only as good as the opportunities that teachers are giving students. 
within that tool. So for example, if you're taking a paper pencil worksheet and you're sharing that, that really doesn't give any richness or creativity, right? That whole piece is missing because you're just moving from a paper pencil to a substitution of using the computer keyboard. And so this is a great opportunity to really look at the difference between assessment and evaluation. And that's one of the things I worked a lot with teachers on because we really need to be focusing on formative assessment. So I, I refer to that as Stiggins and Wiggins do from the United States that we're looking at assessment for learning and assessment as learning. So when your students are creating, when they're developing a video tutorial to explain a math concept, is the teacher able to see from that video that the student understands the concept? They're using the right vocabulary. Are they able to successfully teach a classmate? And if all of those answers can be seen as being rich evidence, then that student gets an A. That if a student can create something that demonstrates their skill and knowledge, why are we then giving them a paper pencil test? But, but that requires a lot of trust in the teacher and her abilities. Absolutely. You're gonna have it, parents saying that, why has this kid got an A, my kid got a B, and this is what she did and then because this is not, it's easier for us as teachers to give the exam and say, this is the right answer. See that that's why she got an A, she scored 87, she's got 83. But as a teacher, doesn't it make your role very difficult? No, I, I, I have to argue this point with you. I think it makes your job richer. I think it makes the teacher's job much more um, engaging, much richer. I think that the information and, and the relationship they have with their student is greater. Think about what Jacob said in terms of his kids building with him. What if the, his, student, his children had filmed that process and then narrated it and talked about how they had measured, what equipment they needed, how they needed to use the tools? Not only would the teacher have rich evidence of what his children learned, but also Jacob does. If you think about a student reading a book and, and reading a story on tape, on, on a video, or even just a voice recording in November, and then you have that child do a voice recording of them reading another text in January, the teacher and the parents are able to see how much more that student has learned. So I think these are the things that we have to look at. We have to really change the paradigm. We have to really change what we think education is and what our role as educators is in terms of how do we assess and evaluate. There's been far too much emphasis in education in my 35 years in the profession on final evaluations. And final evaluations 99% of the time are paper and pencil. And by virtue of those tasks, you only find out a certain amount of information. And too much of that is memorized regurgitation. Yeah. So I think there are opportunities here that, you know, needed to happen over the years. It's unfortunate that it's happened in a time of crisis because we're not all prepared. Um, but I think we have an opportunity here to make some real significant changes in the process of education that will have long-term positive results. No, that's true, because if this can't change us, then I, I don't think anything is going to change us. We've never been hit as hard as we've been hit with COVID-19, right? So I mean, we have a huge equity issue, though. I, I've been to South Africa many times and have worked with teachers there, so I can very much appreciate what our colleague was saying about um, education in South Africa. I mean, we can't rely totally on technology as our vehicle for teaching our students. And I think that's one of the great challenges, particularly in countries that are both first world and third world. You know, there are, I'm quite sure, more than a few million students in South Africa who don't have access to technology. What's happening with their education? If we can't make those changes in the short run, how do we support those students when school gets back to the norm? Yeah. You know, what are they going to need in order to help them through this challenging time? I think we saw the similar data in even India's, uh, we have a huge difference between the haves and the haves now. So we had yeah. a, a survey of government schools that, uh, and 30% of kids were in no way connected with the school at all since the lockdown. And uh, so Kabelo, this, this thought of 
teachers being now having to do something which is much more than they were ever trained for. Do you think teachers are ready for this? Now we're talking about their safety. We were talking about their, you know, uh, way of learning. And now on top of it, if you have assessments like this, do you, th do you see these changes happening in the developing world as well? So maybe we might see it happen in Canada. We might see it happen in Europe, but do you think South Africa is going to have these changes or are we going to just go back to the same way of pen and paper tests and what's your take on assessments? Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. And that is the challenge, the challenge in South Africa. It seems like a lot of the solutions that the ministry is proposing are copied from the first world countries, of which South Africa is nowhere anywhere near that. Mm. So what I was saying the other time when I was speaking on this topic, I said it is very worrying that we can have an education system in South Africa which was never transformed since the 18th century. If you look at everything in South Africa, there's been transformation, but in education, even up to this day, we still have a teacher that stands in front of a classroom and preaches like a pastor, whereas learners are sitting down and listening. So education is much more still controlled or educator orientated, whereas I was arguing with the education ministry to say that, um, I see COVID-19 as an opportunity in disguise for us to be able to reflect and restart education, reimagine how education happens in South Africa. For example, if you look at the reasons why um, there's this rush to the opening of schools, the reason that parents cannot look after their children, therefore they have to come back to school. So basically, our education institutions have been turned into babysitting centers whereby teachers role in terms of education and teaching has been removed and it's more about looking after the children while the parents are at work and when they come back from work um, they go home whereas we need to change this and and i want to agree with everyone's contribution that we need to have an education system that is focused on learners allow learners to use their abilities different intelligences and be able to instead of education for the sake of education, but be able to be educated. You know, it is one Albert Einstein who says that uh, you may take, if, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it might live its whole life thinking that it's stupid. And that's what is happening in South Africa now and across the world maybe in terms of assessment. We are assessing in terms of an intelligence, a type of intelligence that not all learners have, but also the field is not so uh, equal that we are assessing the, even the curriculum content. You know, you would be shocked if I tell you that there are learners in South Africa who have never seen, who have never seen a USB memory stick. And in most of our examinations, when they are being said, such things are being used as examples. And you find that even the language, because in South Africa, I think as you've known that we've got 11 official languages. So we've got villages where English is not even a language that's spoken. Learners only try to speak the language when they go to school. Yet English is the language of instruction, of instruction across all schools. You know, so it's, it's always difficult. The, the field is not equal. So we need to design our education system in a manner that focuses on the learner and the community, the, 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 the immediate environment that the learner finds themselves in. So it's very difficult, but also to do that in terms of globalization, because you find that our education systems seek to be equal with the one of the world, whereas the world itself is not equal. So I don't see how it's going to assist our learners for them to go back to the same education system that they were before the lockdown. Because at the end of the day, it's just orientated in providing a service for the sake of providing a service and the quality of education there is missed totally. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in February this year, I was part of a program where um, I was assisting parents with homeschooling because I realized that most teachers, even most principals and teachers in schools do not know anything about technology. So they couldn't send um, learners work from home. Whereas in private schools, education was continuing as normal. Actually, one of my colleagues was a friend was telling me that in some of their private schools, learners decided that they're not going back to school because they've actually covered what they should have missed during the lockdown, they were doing homeschooling. But in public education, it's a stress of how are we going to catch up, how are we going to restructure the curriculum and all of that. But more, the biggest challenge that learners were facing, and I realized that it's something that we're facing all the time, 
is that we were giving them homework, we were giving them worksheets to work from home, but they had no feedback in terms of the work that they were doing. So you find that the learner is investing a lot of their time studying a concept, but because they don't have feedback, they're not sure whether what they're doing is correct or not. So mm. how, come, how about we come up with a system that will allow them to get immediate feedback, even when schools are reopened. When a learner is preparing for an examination, no one is there to guide the learner to tell them whether whatever they're studying is, is correct or not. So you find that you study, you spend five hours preparing for an examination, only to find that you are studying the wrong thing, but no one was there at home to tell you because we are so much dependent on the teacher being there and, you know, babysitting the learners. And I don't think that's what education should be doing. Education uh, should be providing and yeah, producing I think independent that's, thinkers. That's a very, very common mistake I'm seeing in India as well. We, most of online, the word online learning, it's, it's just may, means broadcasting. It's one way, mostly. It's, uh, even if some, of the, some parents are using WhatsApp, and schools are using, sending material through WhatsApp, there is no feedback coming in. So, um, Kim, I just want to get back to you on this one. How, do you, how should l parents look at, or educators uh, give feedback in this environment where it's more of a broadcasting that's happening? So, uh, is there, and, and Cabello mentioned that's very, very important that uh, for that human to be there to guide them. And Dr. Edward also talked about that the granny part. So how should, how in, in this environment when teachers are at home and we have a difference in the haves and the have nots that you talked about, how should feedback and evaluation be done? I mean, not for the sake of grades, but just to give children direction. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole piece around formative assessment. And even here in Canada, my friend has, you know, been a little bit beside herself because her children are getting tasks to do from their teachers and they're submitting them and they're not getting feedback. So it's happening here as well. If, you know, my feeling is if that, if the teacher is able to disseminate that information to the students through technology, then they have the capacity to give that child feedback, right? Oh. So if the child's receiving it through a technological tool, then that tool also would provide the teacher the opportunity to give that student feedback because the student is submitting it. So to me, there's no excuse for that feedback not to be happening. In other situations, I think it's more complex. It really depends on how the tasks are being given out. Um, you know, I know in some situations in the States, teachers were dropping off worksheets. Well, that's a different story because then you're going to pick the worksheets up, bring them home, mark them, and then the whole cycle goes around in that full circle on really what is the value of those worksheets. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very complex. Um, and it goes back to that whole role of feedback is critically important and timely feedback is what helps our students learn. And we need to work harder on figuring out how to do that. That is, that is what formative assessment is all about. And without that, you don't have real learning. Um, Cabello also can, mentioned can, one. Yes. Yeah. Ed. Can I, can I add to that? Um, I think uh, Kim raises some good points. Simply stated, it's the reality is, yeah, the grade is one thing that you can measure. But what we're finding is even having the grades doesn't really tell you how it, skilled that particular individual is. In a world Absolutely. where you can Google pretty much any answer, uh, it doesn't really matter that much what you know. It matters much more what you can create. And in terms of evaluation, we say it's hard, maybe in education, but if you look at your typical employer who just looks up your LinkedIn profile, looks at all those little pictures, or maybe they looked up your uh, Facebook profile and they figure out pretty darn quick, is this a person I want to hire? Is this not a person I want to hire? They can make that assessment. So they're being evaluated already based on their creative output. And how are we preparing these kids? Because this is the thing about where the world is going. Um, I think World Economic Forum, it was saying, oh, yeah, 50% of the skills that are needed are like going to be obsolete by 2022. No, 2020. That's, that's when this is happening. Our, like, imagine if school taught you 100% of everything that you needed to know in two years, they were saying 50% of it would already be useless, right? So now the question is really, what can I do in this case in the fourth industrial revolution where most of the types of job growth uh, that exists today is not in the areas of working for the big companies. It is not routine work. 
it is the non-routine work that is seems to be the one that is dominating right now. So um, most of the job growth in North America is in small medium enterprise. So these are the you know the Airbnbs, the Ubers, you know the, these new types of companies where things are changing on such a regular basis. So what would it be like to prepare people to work for that kind of environment where things are going to change? What you know in this case isn't really going to matter that much because things are changing so dynamically. And I think that if we focus a little bit more on those types of 21st century skills, we're going to, like, this is the challenge. Like, even in Alberta, where we are, we have record unemployment of degree-holding youth, people who have got the degree, but they can't get jobs because most of the things that they're, they're trained up for are basically routine types of work. And there's, there isn't a lot of jobs for that. Like, as educators, we often say, oh, I, we prepare, you know, our kids for everything. But the reality is we actually prepare our kids to be more like ourselves. And if what we do is mostly routine work, we run through those same worksheets, we run through the same PowerPoints, you know, all the time, then kids, when they see that, like we're the role model, right? So they'll see that type of behavior and be like, hmm, maybe that's what jobs are like in the future. It's just going to be the same thing over and over again. It's like, no, like we need to like start getting through this, uh, this, this notion of perfection is not how we build connection. It's really the, the imperfections, our failures, our, our struggles. That is how we build authentic, authentic connection. And right now, I, it, it feels like the need is more on the connection side and, and less on the, hmm, you just need to, like, I need to push this information to you. Like, you need to be a sponge. Like, why? You know, Google remembers it just fine. I don't need, <laughs> my brain doesn't need to, yeah, store all this information that's already out there that's accessible. Jacob, that's really entirely your uh, career path and your life motto right there that Edwards uh, clarified, right? So, yeah, I was very happy about that. <laughs> very <laughs> insightful. Nodding, nodding ahead. What's your take on that? And what's your recommendation for teachers and parents? How do they take this forward? And uh, we all understand that even today when we interview people, we don't look at their grades in grade seven, eight, and nine, and okay, you got 60% marks and it hardly matters. I would, as Edward said, we look at, look at their LinkedIn profile. We look at what they've done. Have they posted something on an article or maybe on LinkedIn, which is more disruptive in the industry. That's, that's a better hire than somebody who got better grades. So as parents, how should I prepare? I mean, I have, we can see the, it's easy to say that, yes, you can do all these. But where do I start thinking? Should I just look around my, my world and say, okay, how do I involve my child? Because right now parents are also stressed about livelihood, their own livelihoods. So it's, it's good to be relaxed on a Sunday and say, okay, let's fix up the car. But mm -hmm. I'm at home stuck and there are the health issues. I have to wash my hands 20 times a day now. And uh, how do, how, what, what's your recommendation for parents? How should they look at this whole environment? So for oh. my own, oh, so Jacob, go ahead. Please. Um, some of the things that I thought about also when, when uh, Ed was talking was that when, when uh, employees, they look at a person's LinkedIn profile of it, they're not only looking at what they create, but actually also how they interact with people. Yeah. And I think this whole um, pandemic uh, has really shown us that we often talk about this new normal that will be afterwards. But I actually think that what, what this situation shows us is that the world is always in, in, in a constant change. So, 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 what, what, so it's hard to teach some, some certain skills. I think what we need to teach people is to be adaptable, that they are great problem solvers, that they have uh, the skills to to analyze a situation, to to uh, figure out what is the smart move to do here, and so on. Um, and when we talked about this feedback, I think for for teachers right now, something that can be important to 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 remember is that feedback is something that drives motivation. And and if it can be challenging in some places, I also have a great friend in the UK. Uh, at a school where they also worked uh, offline and handed out uh, paper assignments and so on. But, but that's, I think that motivation can also come from 
of course, giving students choice and having choice on that, but also being in groups. So, so there they actually solved it by having those, uh, or the, the, the parents solved it by, by letting the students be in virtual groups together and discussing and, and feeling, um, getting this feeling of, of being in it together uh, so that students actually also could give feedback and, and motivation to each other. That's not only the role of the teacher, if we do it smart, we can actually make sure that the, that the kids also are connected uh, and, and are giving feedback and are looking on in each other's work. So that was one element of it. But I think actually it's so important to remember that when we talk about the future of education, that yes, technology is a tool, it's an important tool uh, because it can give access and, and, and can open up the world. But it's much more about our educational mindset and then the human potential uh, also. And that it's very touching to, to hear about the complexity of the, the challenges in, in South Africa, for example. But I think it's so important to remember that the human po potential is, is huge uh, everywhere. Uh, and it's much more about a mindset in education. And then it's of course important to see how can we over the next decade make sure that every kid has some kind of broadband access, some kind of device so that they can share their potential with the world. Um, but I think actually your question was much more about what could we as parents do? I think as a parent, I think it's important to remember that the kind of jobs that your kid can, will probably have in the future is not depending on the grades. It's not that dependent on the current curriculum, uh, but it's much more, dependent on if is, is your kid actually a nice human being to others? Is it, is it pleasant to be together with that kid? Uh, is, it, um, is it a kid that is good to create con new connections or tell stories or um, solve problems, identifying problems? That's will, that will be the skills that depend, uh, that will, will make sure that if the kid get a exciting job or get good friends, will have a happy life. And so I think this final uh, exam, examination or evaluation when we leave this world will be much more based on those human skills, how we treat each other, how we use our creativity. And I will not stay on our gravestone, be anything about our grades. I think, I think that's even true even today when I'm recruiting and we fear, find some, somebody who's really talented, but I feel they're not be, they'll not get along with the team. They'll not, they might be in, uh, you know, they might create a culture problem of arguments. And, and he's, I don't think he has those human skills to work in a team. And it's something that in schools, we teach something the opposite, right? We say, you look after yourself. Don't worry about the others. It's, it's, a, it's a rat race out there. For 14 years, we train our kids to be in a rat race where, why are you worried? If he's not studying, why are you worried if his grades are, you know, that's how kids always say, I got B, but he got a C. So we say, no, why didn't you get an A? That's not your problem, right? So we've taught them to work in isolation and be focused only on themselves, their own grades. And then they go out to the world and they're supposed to work in teams, which they clearly lag. And I think that's something even today, we've seen that in our recruitment process where we've noticed. And as you said, not just on LinkedIn, also, I've, I have done that personally. I've seen the kind of comments they've posted on somebody's post, whether they liked it, it gives me a, a really good per, you know, perception of the individual because otherwise in an interview, the person is at their best behavior right now. Who is the person really behind that mask that we're all putting? So social media really helps. Uh, but Dr. Ed, I have a question for you. Since you were involved with this company, which was, which uh, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, invented the smart boards, right? And it became the word smart came from there. And um, Cabello said, you can, nothing has changed in South Africa. I think that's true anywhere in the world. You can take a teacher from 150 years back and put her in today's classroom. And uh, apart from history, which is, I mean, everything else, I mean, the same, uh, we still have the Renan Martin grammar book that we still teach from in our, in our, in our grammar. We have those <laughs> stories of fiction. I mean, uh, science has evolved a bit, but mathematics is a sales algebra. So, uh, how do you see classrooms change? I mean, where, where are you seeing? And because clearly the smart board was, was just uh, an extension of what Cabello was just saying that the same sage in front of the class using instead of 
a blackboard she she the teacher he or she just has a smart board so where why was why could why aren't we look at something more interactive engaging one to one personalized why is it just um, today's uh, you know if you have to have a okay we have a smart class smart class means a smart board in front of it that's is that really how much we have been able to evolve when the world around us has changed and uh, kabelo again mentioned that everything else has changed but education sadly has not changed and let's look at educators as you use this chance to change how our children learn so how do you see this playing out in the classrooms and schools of tomorrow so uh thank you for that amal i would say um in kathy davidson's book the new education she often says that we're going to see more changes in the the next few years in education that we've seen in the last 100 and i would definitely say like the situation we have right now is definitely a more than 100 year type of change yeah and i think what we're finding and and this is perhaps a bit more of a generalization is that employers increasingly are seeking not degrees because the signal of a degree uh used to be very a strong indicator that this person is hard working they are conforming that they are like they are kind of intelligent they used to be a very strong indicator because you had a very small percentage that could have it but as more and more people like we have this um education inflation that signal is no longer becoming a a really good uh thing and so what are they going back to you'll see um a lot more emphasis on skills and which is really interesting because like people say i have skills in certain types of development or certain types of like things that are really of interest to me because that signals a return to the apprenticeship model and if you look at the if you look at like um i remember in the millionaires education they referred to um these all these people who dropped out of school and they made you know million plus a year um what were the skills that they had that they don't really teach in school that helped them become so successful i think to jacob's point earlier there there are a couple things like he, he mentioned networking some of these these top millionaires they're incredible at networking they have skills to be able to connect people to make things happen they know they have they have these webs these networks that are just they're worth they your your network is your net worth right so the more you the better your network you know the more you're going to be able to connect with people and then the other is some of these folks are some of the best at sales like they are they are able to convince people hmm to separate from their money uh, a lot better than your your average population they really understand people's pain their needs and that what is that that's a communication skill right and we talk about communication in terms of oh you like you were mentioning amal you were mentioning the grammar book before it's like ah oh, man like i i struggle with this a lot because i'll be honest with you we have so much emphasis right now in education on reading and writing and we have so little emphasis on speaking and listening and there are so many other skills outside of reading and writing that are important like just tonality facial expression you know that we are totally missing in the uh in the reading and writing component alone and let's be honest like you see what's happening with newspapers people aren't making a lot of money just reading they're not paying you to read they're not paying you to and if they're paying you to write they're paying you very little so let's not like spend our time emphasizing on a lot of skills that aren't really going to pay the bills and can i just add a little point to that what you just said i i this is something a mantra i say to teachers all the time is that reading and writing comes from oral language you have exactly. to have oral language in order to learn how to read and write <laughs> and why are our classrooms so quiet right i mean you yeah. walk around an elementary school and everybody's going shh and don't talk in the hallways and be quiet so your point is very well made and i think we have to reinforce with both parents and educators that reading and writing comes from oral language you know i i often say to people think about it when you're reading text you're hearing it spoken in your brain mm -hmm. and so that oral communication is so critically important and that may be something i'm all that your participants i see a couple of people have their hands raised that we can reinforce with parents is having those rich conversations is really going to help their children learn and to to be better readers and writers um and 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 help them with some of those academic skills that are not going to change in the short run 
I mean, I, I, I like to think that the creativity will grow. I think COVID is a big opportunity for that, but we have some work systemically to do. And I know we have to do that in Canada and, and I'm sure in uh, other countries as well. There are some significant systemic conversations and changes that need to happen, but I, I think we all agree that this may have been the little explosion that will finally help those conversations come to the forefront. Okay. I love that, Kim, um, because to me, the the times like this where everybody's at home results in a lot of self-reflection and a lot of understanding themselves and a lot of creativity. It's one of the reasons why a lot of the services that people use today, like the Airbnbs, the Uber, Slack, all these services, they arose from the 2008 financial crisis, you know, where people were unemployed, they were at home. What do I do? Yeah. And that type of reflection is also related to, you were, um, Amal was talking about the parent. Like, my point isn't to get my kids to learn more about pirates, because I, I hope that in the end, they're going to learn that it was never about the pirates. It was always about their interests and going You want that deep. learning to transfer to other situations. Exactly. They can, they can, they can go deep in any subject. Exactly. And once they find that out, then it's powerful, right? Like, this is for me, this is why I'm in education. I hated school up to like grade seven till I found a, a French language arts teacher that was saying, oh, you know, you're struggling a lot, but you're creative. So I'll give you some opportunities to be creative. And I just realized that creativity is not limited to one subject. You can do it in every subject. So every assignment, every subject had some element of that in it. And now you couldn't stop me from learning. I was motivated. I wanted to. And, then, and that's what drove me all through my PhD. And I think yeah. for a lot of people, it's going to be the same. Um, it's going to be the, like, why do I need to learn this? You don't have that question when it's your interests. You want to learn it. You'll, you'll learn it, you know, even if you don't have to. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, some show of hands. If anybody wants to ask a question on Zoom, so uh, please just raise your hand. We'll be happy to, I think, because then we have to finish the session within five minutes. Uh, anybody who has wishes to just lower all the hands first because there were some hands by mistake. If somebody wants to, please uh, raise your hand. There's a, there's a, there's a, you can click on raise your hand and we'll get you to the, the, the question. So I think uh, we've got some uh, awesome ideas. I think we've, we've gone down to the crux of what teaching and learning is about. It's about those 21st century skills and they're going to matter more and more in how happy and successful our kids are going to be. Uh, so that is, of course, the challenge. And of, of course, the challenge in the, in the, but it's all, you also talked about that, that teacher who, who put that spark in you, right? So mm -hmm. that, that teacher, whether it's a parent or a teacher or, a, or someone inspirational, you think that that role is always going to be there, right? So somebody has to, or do you think, um, so if children, if as a parent, I don't see it, is it my responsibility to then try and, you know, dig up these, what do you like? And should, are these the kind of conversations we should be having in, in our families about trying to find what their interests are and then uh, let them go in that direction? Is that something that you would recommend to parents? Absolutely. I think that's critically important, right? That's encouraging your child. That's what parenting is all about. Mm -hmm. But they are, they are stuck still between curriculum and uh, there's something. Well, let, let's try and find the balance, Amal. Let's, let's try and find the balance. I think that's what's most important. We're not going to be able to change everything overnight. Okay. Uh, I think we've got a question from uh, Ms. Tina Jolly. So I'll, uh, would you like to, uh, I'll ask to unmute. If you can unmute yourself, I'll unmute uh, if you would like to start a video, you can ask through a video or you would like to unmute yourself or you can write in the chat box. So I'll ask a question. So any other questions, please raise your hand or write in the chat box. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, so I, I want to add to what Kim said, like just as a parent, it like sometimes they, they, we try to provide all the opportunities we can to our kid without the expectation that they're going to succeed in everything, right? Like if you, you do a bunch of different sports or different types of activities, you'll find certain things that stick. And then you, that's what you focus on. And that's how you build up that, your, your kids. 
And it's the same thing is like, they don't need to do everything. They, they just need to find like some things that they're really successful. So don't worry too much about the, the grades and stressing out on those kind of things. It's easy to do, but we don't need to. But when you, when you have, yeah, we tell parents this, then they start, they start thinking about what their child enjoys. And we get questions like video games. I mean, uh, PUBG and Fortnite. And uh, then they said they feel that our world is very different from the children's world. I mean, so it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort for parents to go into their world and see it from their perspective and then start, you know, otherwise it's just like, you're only 30 minutes of video game, go and focus on your books. You need to study. You have not some of the most popular educational YouTubers. That's exactly what they do. Right. They like Matt Pat, for example, that's all he does is he focuses on the video games and the movies that kids love. And then he connects it to academic topics. So mm -hmm. you don't need to be super creative. You just need to know what the interests are and you can find stuff that relates to it. That goes deep. There are good educators out there. I consider them to be some of the biggest educators because if you can get millions of views per video, then yeah, you're, you're really big in terms of education. So it's there. We just need to find out what the interests are and then point them in the right direction. And the rest is easy. So do you see this, uh, any of you, do you see this advent of super teachers coming where they've got somebody who's really put their brains and figured out how to use PUBG or a Fortnite game to teach concepts. And suddenly you have uh, parents or teachers recommending kids. Is that going to be a new norm? We're going to have these uh, uh, super teachers who are going to be, uh, and uh, when Kabilo mentioned about the quality of teachers and their lack of ability. So, and we've always heard this thing about will technology replace teachers and we always knew the answer is no, but through technology, will certain teachers be replaced because you have these people who have put in some effort into uh, connecting with the kids versus a teacher who just comes in the class and today with the, the hybrid model of uh, learning, uh, will those kind of teachers be eventually uh, be replaced with these teachers? Uh, do I need somebody to teach me algebra the same way they were doing versus somebody who can teach me through my pirates example? Uh, yeah, Jacob, you would like to say something on this? Uh, I think there's a lot of skills involved in being a good teacher. Um, one thing is about this making it exciting or connecting it to, to their passion. Other things is actually being able to connect with a human being and, and uh, taking a deep interest in them or giving good feedback and so on. And that does not necessarily need to be the same teacher or the same person. So I think we could uh, easily imagine um, a scenario where some yeah, great YouTubers uh, or others actually providing really great interesting content and making something that can spark an interest but there will still be a other human being that needs to have the deep discussions with the kids, uh, encourage them to look at the challenge out of other perspective or that they can come to and say, okay, I tried to solve this problem, but those strategies don't work. And, and so I think that that role of the teacher uh, will change, but we do, do still need teachers that can be those personal mentors or uh, coaches. And then there will be teachers that are great at delivering content. Here in Denmark, we saw actually when the pandemic started or the schools closed down, that uh, I think it's a small team of seven teachers started out making content for, for television and national television quickly picked it up and, and broadcasted it. And other teachers, they luckily uh, responded to that and said, okay, you can either work with the assignments I gave you or just work with those that are on television and I will give you feedback on those then. Um, so I think that could be a, a interesting scenario. Because a, a lot of technologies and solutions that came in, uh, there's an initial novelty factor of a new medium, which happened with the, the smart boards as well. When the smart board was there, it's like in our generation when the TV would enter the classroom and we would all get excited for some time. And afterwards we just put our head down. And this is because it's the same regurgitation. So that's always happening in uh, uh, in, in how technology is getting used. So I think that's a great point that you always knew you, you, it'll be a mixture of both the, the super teachers and who have, who have those broadcast content and will do a great job with that. And you need that personalized, customized uh, pat on the back because that very good on the computer screen is not the same as a, a teacher telling you that 
you can do it, right? Yeah, and I want it's not necessarily of, all those who broadcast to thousands of teachers, super teachers or better teachers as we also need the teachers that can look a, a, a student in the eye uh, on one meter's distance or two in this case right now and see, okay, is this kid struggling? What, is, what are they feeling and respond to that? And I think that human skill is a, a great superpower for those teachers who really can connect deeply with a kid. So they are also super teachers. They are not, so I, I want to say- I don't know if I would use yes, the term super important. teachers because I think like a lot of teachers are, are super teachers because of like what's going on right now. But I might, I might use the term specialist teachers um, may, may replace some of the, the more generalist teachers in the same way that like a specialist surgeon will probably make more money than say a general, a general practitioner in medicine. I think in, in, you'll find in education that there will be certain people that you can choose from now in terms of your education. So your used to be like the quality of your education depends on the quality of your teacher. But nowadays, because there's so many different sources out there, you, you pick the ones that work for you. And so those specialists, those people who go deep in terms of your interests, uh, those are the ones you're going to find. And so perhaps specialist uh, may be a more appropriate term than super. <laughs> yeah, so super came from the, the I mean, the, the scope of reach of those teachers not necessarily being a uh, better teacher. So, Kabelo. Um, um, uh, Amul sir, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, if you have a question. Yeah, in fact, I have a couple of questions. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just mm -hmm. wanted to know in a class of 40, how does one uh, cater to, you know, personalized skill-based learning? I mean, according to the interests of the children, uh, you have 40 of them in a class and you have mm -hmm. maybe at the most an hour or so. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. That is one. And secondly, uh, we all understand that this change is not going to happen overnight. So uh, with grades still having uh, a considerable amount of, you know, weightage, uh, how do we just shift totally to skill-based? Because academics have to be given that uh, space that is required. That's a great question, Tinu. Um, and the, the first one that you, you had, I love, because at the beginning of a class, um, you can set up a forum or you can start writing things down about what their specific interests are. And you don't need to cover their interests every class, right? Like you can just go every week, uh, every time we meet, I'm going to cover a different uh, topic of interest. Because what that does is it de develops this fear of missing out. Oh, that could be the week that my topic of interest is going to be covered. I cannot miss any class. I must go and attend. So this is yeah. a good way of bringing their interests in slowly. You don't need to bring every interest in. That won't work. Like you, there's too many interests out there. You've got 40 students. But you'll find that I think over time, certain interests are very common. Oh, a lot of people like pirates. Oh, a lot of people like princesses or a lot of people like certain things. So you'll find overlap in terms of them and that will make it easier. Now, in terms of the, the other part about, well, grades are still gonna matter. Yeah. This is the beauty of this is if you look at the, um, I'm always talking about technology. Um, if you look at, and I don't say, don't look at the research from one case study, like look at the repeated studies from maybe the, um, uh, uh, what works in education, what works clearinghouse, where they look at like studies that are repeatable. The only types of things that really improve grades, engagement, course completion, like they don't drop out of school, is the ones that connect with those student interests. So it's not either or, it's and. You hit those interests, you get the great, look, why is, why is Finland no, so high? Uh, I meant like here in India, in our system of education, we have a set curriculum which we must complete with the children. Of course, mm -hmm. whatever we are teaching them, they must learn from that how to apply it uh, in other situations, no doubt. But that, you know, academic part as such, uh, how does one balance that in the short period of time that we have? So one of the things to think about, and I mean, you know your context far better than we do, but is it possible in terms of that academic content that they can demonstrate their knowledge of that in different ways? 
so that rather than everyone demonstrating their knowledge in the same way at the same time, could they have opportunities to share it in different ways? Maybe someone might create a video. Someone might, uh, let's say you're doing a study in a classic novel. They might reenact a scene in that novel so that they're showing their learning in different ways, but yet you're still seeing that academic knowledge in action. Is, is that feasible? Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds good. That's, I mean, we, we are going to motivate them in that way, but, uh, Let's see. It's going to take some time for the change to happen. We have another Thank stakeholder. Thank you very much. We have another stakeholder in the school, the parents. So if, if there are 15 chapters to be finished and you end up doing 13 in the name of going in depth and letting children explore, suddenly schools and teachers are worried that if I don't finish those, I miss two chapters because, so what we try and do is try and A, take, uh, plan this early on. So you get the parents involved that this is how we're going to do it. And this, this is a reason why we're going to not do these chapters perhaps because there's a reason. And once they understand, most parents do understand. The problem is that when experiments start happening along the way and parents are not taken on board, then you have a certain problem because parents saying, why uh, didn't you finish the syllabus? And the other school they finished, I mean, for example, in the pre-primary, they've finished, they've re reached letter L and you're stuck at C. And those, those kids are moving forward. That school is, is ahead of you. The school is not ahead of us. It's just that they chose to uh, pressurize and run through the whole syllabus. So that's one of the keys, I think, is to keep the parents uh, in the loop of what you're trying to achieve. I think. I think that's really, really, really important. And it's been a historical problem in education is that we're not providing parents with enough of the knowledge that they need in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's the mm -hmm. classic issue in education that we have the cart before the horse. Right. I mean, this has been happening for a long time, but I think the parent education piece is key. I think we need to have them involved and, and we need to have them involved, not just us disseminating, you know, handouts to them with this is what we're doing at school, but how about talking to them about the why we're doing it. I remember years and years ago, we started bringing calculators into math classes and parents were very, very, very upset because my child needs to memorize their math skills, right? They need to memorize how to the multiplication facts. And I did a number of evenings where I invited parents with their students together. And they did a whole bunch of math challenges where they were using the calculator. And the parents realized, oh, they still had to know whether they were pressing addition or multiplication or division. And it was, it was comforting and reassuring for them. And they were seeing their children learn and engage in activities at the same time as them. And I think we need to do more of that in education where feasible. Yeah, Cabello, you wanted to add on to that? But I wanted to say that, you know, I think the problem with our education is that, I don't know, maybe, maybe across the world, but also in South Africa, is that when it was designed initially, it was not designed to produce what we are looking for today. I think if you look at the history of schooling across countries, South Africa, the history of apartheid and all of that. And the problem is that when people realize that there is the need for skills in the general labor market, they just took on what was already there and tried to come up with a system that would provide the skills in a rushed approach. Approach, And they forget that education as it is today in the world is very different from what the need was in those years. So the reluctance to transform education is what is making it impossible for us to get to what we are looking for. I'm listening to the story in India from the lady that just, that just asked the question now, and it's almost similar in South Africa. And I'm trying to think on how she can approach that in a different manner. And I'm thinking it's impossible because when I look at it from a South African perspective, it's not allowed for a teacher to just decide to change the form, the format of, 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 of an assessment because we're using the same curriculum, the same assessment nationally. So I can't decide as a teacher that I'm gonna change what's already there and make it my own or make it in a manner that's going to be you know, convenient for my learners. So I have to go with whatever is in the curriculum. I have to finish it. I have to go with whatever is in the book. Another problem is that when I look at the parental involvement in education, is that parents seem to be involved when they're asking for accountability from the teachers. 
they seem to forget that they also have a very important role to play in the education of their own learners, of their own children. What I say usually is that the parent is supposed to actually manage the education of their own children. The teacher is supposed to only facilitate this education. And then learners themselves are supposed to direct their own education. What would they like to see? That's why sometimes the issue of careers come, on, come into play because it is the child that decides which career they need to take, they need to follow. So they need to be very involved in directing this education. And government is supposed to be serving the, all of these stakeholders in making sure that whatever their desires are, are served. But as it happens today, it seems like government is managing the education. And then um, teachers are, are babysitting the education, whereas learners just come because they don't have a choice. They're just coming to school because they're told just come to school. Yeah. And the role for parents is not, the parents are seeing, are seeing like they are policing education. And that's wrong. It's not supposed to be in that manner. So I, I, I sort of feel like until we come to a realization and until we have that willing, political willingness for us to be able to provide quality education, we're never going to get there. And we need to start having these conversations with parents. We need to start having these conversations with ourselves as teachers, with learners themselves, we need to involve learners in education, we need to allow them to reason to us. In South Africa, I mean, traditionally, it's, it's seen as almost as disrespectful if a learner is to reason with a teacher. You know, in, 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 in my school, I'm a union leader, I, I organize teachers, but I'm also a teacher. I've had a conversation with a colleague who says, she doesn't like learners who would talk back at a teacher. And I was like, but to me, that's what I want, because I want them to reason. I want to understand why they got to whatever decision that they made. But for her, because she was an adult teacher, almost 60 years old, she feels it's disrespectful. And, and I agree, traditional and cultural disrespectful. But for me as a young teacher, I want that. In the classroom, I want to have learners taking control of their own learning so that I can only facilitate and direct and make sure that they're on the right point. But I almost feel like I'm a professional. And that's what my role must be. I always tell teachers that I organize that you are professionals. You went to school to get the academic side of your, your, your careers, not to babysit. So the problem is that, especially in South Africa, maybe across the world, teachers are expected to be in the classroom teaching. They're expected to be psychologists. They're expected to be uh, uh, counselors, career counselors. They're, supposed to, they're expected to be medical practitioners in terms of when the learner is ill and all of that. And it's impossible. If you look at higher education, where it's tertiary, you realize that lecturers are just going there to facilitate, and then they leave education to the learners. And that's where these learners are able to become independent thinkers. That's where they are able to analyze their own learning and come up with, that's why you have to be a researcher in higher education, but why should we not allow learners to be researchers in basic education, especially once they get to a certain period of um, um, secondary education? We don't know. So we need to rethink of, are we still in the right place? I mean, are we, why did, are we designing the education to benefit learners or are we designing it for us to be able to manage learners in terms of what do they think, how do they think, when do they think and when not to think? Because it has happened, as it happens, learners think only when they're in school, but when they're at home, it's not there. In conclusion, I struggle with, you know, sometimes when you give learners examples of what is in the curriculum and you try to give them an example of, these things happen at home. They don't understand. If you, if you talk to learners about electricity, they fail to understand that whatever you're speaking about is how they get electricity at home. It's connected. And they can't even get to understand that this is how they, this is their life. They think education is just for the school and their life is something different. So we need to all be together in this and stop thinking that someone has the authority over the education of another, but work together and have consultative solutions in all of this. Until then, I don't see how education can happen in the manner that we wish for it to. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, schools in, uh, and I know more so in developing countries is, is where the school and the home environment are, are almost like they enter a different dimension, right? At the home, they have devices, they can borrow their parents' cell phone here, no cell phone, you have to wear a uniform, you sit in a classroom, you go, you go for toilet breaks when you, you, you're allowed to, you're not supposed to answer back, you don't have anything, to, you're, you're being bombarded, you have no choice at all, at all in terms of a traditional school system. But at the same time, I think what is changing is this ability that you said of uh, teachers 
who don't like to be, uh, and that that is changing. I think that's, I mean, teachers are getting exposed now with the technology to accepting that there is a perhaps a better way when children do answer back, but that means they are involved in schools. And we're seeing that percolate even in India from new age schools to traditional teachers who are now kind of being okay with the fact that they're being questioned. And it's okay for them to, because now the scary thing is when teachers, children ask questions, teachers sometimes don't have the answer, but the, the child has Googled it beforehand. So now the teacher's in a spot and suddenly that sense of, I know it all in the walking encyclopedia, that myth gets broken up, broken down because, and teachers need to be okay with the fact. I think we all humans can, nobody can be a walking encyclopedia today. I think so. I think it's, it's happening. I think that the good thing is that we're all being a part of this chain. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's uh, a really good perspective that you've uh, brought to the table. So I think uh, a fantastic session. I think I, I really, really enjoyed being a part of this session. I think I learned a lot and I believe we've got, uh, we'll be sharing this video everywhere, uh, wherever we can. So thank you everyone for uh, being a part of this session from taking time out, uh, came early morning, Dr. Ed, early morning for you, uh, evening for Dr. J uh, for Mr. Jacob and Cabello as well in the afternoon. So everyone's taken time out from their schedule. It was a, it was a bit of a challenge to mix up all the time zones, but I think what we've got out of it is a really good understanding as, as teachers, as parents of how, and ultimately it's about our children, that we're all here for our children. So thank you so much for being part of this uh, amazing panel and uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you. One last um, thing that I'd like each one of you to share, uh, how can people get in touch with you? I mean, sure there's some people who you must have inspired in the audience or who are watching on social media. So how can they quickly get in touch with you? Kim, I know you've written a fantastic book on assessments for parents in India. It's available on amazon.com. Do check it out. Amazon.in. Uh, do check it out. So if you could just uh, quickly just share it because I'm sure people who they, you built some fans in the audience today, all four of you. So how can they keep in touch with you? Can you just quickly share? Well, uh, pretty simply, if you just remember kimmeldrum.com, that's my website and there's a link to my email there. And uh, I'd be happy to communicate with anyone. And I want to say thank you, Amal, for putting this group together. I think you, you did a really wonderful job of finding people from all around the world who uh, happily are very like-minded. So it, it was really a treat to, to speak with everyone and to hear your thoughts and ideas. Dr. Ed, how do you- We'll all be in touch again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um... So getting in contact with me, uh, you could reach me on Twitter at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R-E-T. Uh, or uh, the company I work with uh, is called Nuitech, N-U-I-T-E-Q.com. And on the website, we have uh, a blog with some white papers. And one of the white papers is uh, future skills and the uh, future jobs and the skills needed to get them. So if you want to learn a little bit more, like that's just a, like a free white paper that you guys can access. Super. Jacob? Yeah, um, I'm also on Twitter. I think that's the best way to, to reach me um, as uh, Jacob Espen uh, in one word uh, and Jacob with a K. Um, and then I have my own uh, podcast, uh, Breakfast Conversations, where I uh, talk with educators from around the world oh. uh, about topics uh, like this today. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for inviting us. I think it has been really, really lovely to discuss those important topics and uh, I really also encourage all the parents that are maybe listening that, that there's so much creative potential in their kids. So if they uh, have any ideas right now for starting something entrepreneurial or following a passion project, I think also set their kids free to do that and encourage them to follow their dreams, uh, use those special times to, to do those special projects and also just to create closer bonds in the families. I think that's so important to do this in these strange times. So thank you, uh, Amal, for the opportunity to be here today. And Cabello? Um, yes, um, thank you very much. I want to really appreciate the opportunity that you've created. I feel like it's about time because Really, education is international. Uh, we can never have an education that is focused in one specific region or area. So I hope to have uh, to see more of such um, 
engagements happening across the world. And um, I'm on Twitter, it's my name and my surname, Gabelo Mashobokwani, which can be a quite difficult surname to remember, but on Facebook as well is Gabelo Mashobokwani. Uh, the organization that I work with is the Educators Union of South Africa on Facebook and on both Twitter. But one simplest way to find me is the marketing app.co.za and you can find more of my contact details there. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, it's a special day for us as well because we're celebrating about 75 days of our home learning, which started after the pandemic. And it's been, a, it's been an absolutely amazing learning experience, not just for the children, but for us. And this um, webinar has been a part of it. We've been uh, um, um, the learning that we've got from feedback from parents, what has worked, what has not worked. So for us, it was almost like building an airplane while it was flying. So we're mm -hmm. building it and we're, we were flying it. So, on, or you say, you know, jumping off the plane and then we made the parachute. So we were all forced into this, but it's been absolutely an amazing journey. I mean, uh, to develop this new age learning system. And I think going forward at Shemrock and Shemford, we are going to be taking a lot from today's session. And the, as Dr. Ed said, the hybrid model or the blended learning is going to be the new normal for uh, teaching and learning. So thank you so much for sharing your perspectives from across the world. Uh, you've surely benefited thousands of children who are in our schools. They will benefit from today's discussion. Thank you for taking time out from your schedules. Uh, appreciate it and do keep in touch. We'd love to have you in some future sessions. You've been, um, all of you have been totally amazing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.